Here we are in an ongoing COVID crisis. Yes, the vaccine is on the way, but no one imagines that the economic problems that have been experienced in Australia, as in so many other countries during the last year, are going to disappear overnight. We've got to be thinking about what it would take to create a, a decent economic recovery, a fairer society, a more sustainable uh, future for us all. Uh, and of course, that raises some pretty profound questions about our political system. Is it capable of delivering what we need in these uh, difficult circumstances? Uh, so to address these questions, and maybe some more too, uh, we've got uh, Ben Spies Butcher and Mike Beggs. Mike Beggs is a lecturer at uh, the, sorry, senior lecturer, I should say, at uh, in political economy department at the University of Sydney. Uh, he's someone I've known for many years because that was my department before I took retirement. And uh, I, I have to tell you that he's uh, one of Australia's leading political economists. So his thoughts on a topic like this are particularly important. Uh, a second speaker will be Ben Spies Butcher, also well known to me because he, like uh, Mike, did his PhD in political economy at the University of Sydney. And he's currently the chair of the discipline of sociology at Macquarie University. So without further ado, let me first introduce Mike Beggs. Thanks, thanks, Mike. And you want me sitting here so that's for the cameras? Everyone can see me okay? Great. Uh, thanks very much, Frank. I'm really uh, delighted to be here at Politics in the Pub because when I first came to move to Australia about 15, 16 years ago as a political economy student, I think I first came to Politics in the Pub to see Frank at... Uh, <laughs> The Gaelic Club, uh, you know, sometime between 2005, 2006, and I was a regular there for quite a long time until I, my daughter was born and I moved away, stopped going to the pub, stopped watching politics, etc. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, delightful to be here. And I think what's also amazing is the fact that we're actually arguing it in a pub. I think at the time Frank invited me last year, it seemed pretty unlikely that we'd be in a pub anytime soon. And I assumed I'd be just doing this through Zoom. So it's really, really nice uh, to be here. And it's weird kind of how almost normal things are seeming again, uh, right? Being here in a pub. So I'm gonna ask everybody to cast their mind back to where they were about exactly a year ago, right? When things, you know, the full extent of what we were about to, what was, gonna, what was hitting us was becoming apparent. It would have been sometime about this time of year, I think, that it moved from being something you know, that was affecting our lives to something that was massively affecting all of our lives. And around about this time, uh, it would have been last April, I read a piece with uh, Beck Pierce in sociology at ANU that was published in Jacobin. So what I say today is kind of going to be looking back to that piece. So I have to sort of credit Beck with some of the ideas here. But a year on, I mean, in that time, we were sort of saying what we thought should happen. And now I'm going to look back and see how what did happen uh, compares. So anyway, uh, cast your mind back uh, to this time about a year ago, we're almost exactly the anniversary to the day of uh, a tweet by Madonna, which you, you know, there was a lot going on, so you might not remember this particular tweet. It was deleted pretty quickly afterwards. Uh, so I'm gonna read it out. And she said, uh, the virus doesn't care about how rich you are. It's the great equalizer. And what's terrible about it is what's great about it. But like I used to say at the end of human nature every night, if the ship goes down, we're all going down together. And it was kind of received poorly at the time uh, because, you know, uh, in a sense she was right in that it was certainly about to affect us all. Uh, you know, we, are, we all are, we all were in it together and the, the, the virus sort of revealed our interdependency very starkly, but of course it didn't affect all of us equally. Uh, everybody in this room will have had some kind of experience and it would have been different depending on, uh, you know, where you are in life, you know, how you make a living uh, and a whole lot of other features. And, you know, 
maybe first of all, it, it came onto your radar because it affects your travel plans, right? Uh, and then maybe the travel bans hit. I mean, that was the first big impact on Australia. And that affected some industries, the like universities, for example. Uh, and maybe you got an email from a manager, uh, you know, a stern email about how much you're going to have to, we're going to have to tighten our belts. But then before we knew it, within, you know, two or three weeks, it was actually right uh, upon us out there in the community. Uh, and then what happened next really depended on well, what kind of work you did, right? So maybe you were encouraged and then you were asked to work from home. Maybe you lost hours, maybe you lost shifts, uh, maybe your whole job, maybe your business, uh, because your customers just wouldn't, weren't able to come to your business anymore. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe you work in one of the other sectors like uh, you know, clinics or aged care, uh, supermarkets, food delivery, when all of a sudden work actually uh, intensified, uh, but also became riskier. And then of course the schools closed and somehow you, you, know, you found yourself looking after your kids and somehow having to fit that in uh, as well. And depending on where you work, that would have been easier or harder. I mean, it was difficult for everybody. Uh, but it, how accommodating your employer was to your workloads would make a big difference. And then the lockdowns were truly in place, you know, a month or two on. Uh, and, you know, maybe you're at home drawing your regular salary, but just working on Zoom all day. But maybe you're getting some fraction because you're, your employer is eligible for JobKeeper. And maybe you're not eligible because you're on a casual contract or your, uh, you know, your, your particular employer didn't lose enough to be eligible. Um, or you know, maybe you're on the augmented job seeker, but maybe you're excluded from that because you're a migrant worker. Uh, whatever your case, whatever situation you're in, the same rent was due, or your mortgage payments were still due, and you still had to eat, of course, and make car payments or whatever. Alternatively, you know, some people might were on the other side of those payments. You might have got an email from your property manager that the tenants have fallen behind on rent. Uh, and maybe that made you as a, as a mom and dad investor worried about, you know, your own payments due to the bank. Uh, or, you know, you might have had other assets in your mind, your super portfolio or uh, shares. Nevertheless, though, I think Madonna was right that what happened revealed how interdependent we were. I mean, remember when, you know, you first realized you might be staying at home basically all the time for a couple of weeks and there was that rush on the supermarkets. You know, we suddenly realized how dependent we all are on other people's labor and also uh, how dependent we are, of course, on uh, the financial flows. Because capitalism does involve a highly collectivized division of labor. Right, it's very cooperative. We all just play a little part uh, in that, but it highly individualizes our claims on the product of that uh, collective labor. And our incomes, our, our private incomes, depend very much on the payments of others. And that depends on their inflows. And then those inflows depend on others' payments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when there's a big disruption in that network of uh, financial flows, uh, the market bases that people rely upon, most people rely on to, uh, to live, disappear, and then suddenly this becomes political. People have to turn uh, to the state, and the question becomes whose incomes, whose security gets shored up, uh, and whose is not? Who turns out to have been bearing uh, the risk? Right. So around this time, my co-author, uh, Beck was delving into Facebook forums for mom and dad investors, right? This, this landlord forums public on Facebook. And you could go on, I mean, this is at the point when everybody was freaking out a little bit. And it was kind of sociologically interesting to take a look at what people were saying, right? And uh, property investors were freaking out like everybody else. And, you know, as you'd expect, this is a time when people were starting to realize that they simply wouldn't be able to pay rent for a little while in a lot of cases. Uh, and, you know, you can find some statements of fear and loathing from landlords around that time about their own tenants. You can find a little bit of well-meaning paternalism. One landlord shared about how they were going to offer a toilet paper from their private stockpile to their tenants, uh, for example. 
Uh, but mostly sort of anxiety about, you know, most of these, most property investors are doing it on, uh, you know, with the mortgage, you know, they're uh, having, and they, they're relying on the rent coming in to pay the bank. So there's a lot of anger, like, you know, a lot of, you know, anxiety. So for example, I'm sorry, but as a landlord, how am I supposed to absorb that loss? How do I pay my mortgage? If it was for three months, they'd never be able to backdate it when they start work again. It'll cause a flooded market because we have to sell. Unless the banks write off three months worth of mortgage payments, then the banks will crash. Impossible situation. Landlords have already taken a hit on house prices. Doesn't the community realize that if landlords lose these houses, it's going to be a lot of empty houses, a lot of people homeless? And then people saying things like, hmm, so they can strike on uh, rent, but can we strike against the banks about mortgage payments? No. So it was, you know, there was a lot of realization wherever you were, you were relying on flows, which had suddenly become, uh, you know, very uncertain. It was a very strange economic crisis, right? Historically, very unusual, right? Because instead of uh, being about, you know, caused by a, an, an initial shortfall in demand, because of a financial crisis or because of, you know, something happened to commodities prices, uh, it really started differently, right? It began, it didn't begin with a slump in demand. Instead, it begins with a direct shutdown of a lot of activities. Uh, and then if that's left unaddressed, it would have a flow on impact to the rest of the economy. So some of the early takes, you know, were struggling to find historical parallels. So we heard is it's like, you know, some people, it's like World War I. It'll be over by Christmas, hopefully. Or it's like World War II, it calls for total, well, instead of total mobilization, total planning for total demobilization. We have to plan so that people can stay home for a few months and then unfreeze the economy at the end. Alternatively, it will be like the Great Depression in reverse, right? So uh, with the job losses coming first and financial collapse coming afterwards. At the time, so around last March, the OECD put out one of its original, one of its early projections, and they calculated that uh, shutdowns would directly reduce GDP by somewhere between a fifth and a third of GDP. So that's direct, in those direct sectors, directly shut down. And then, of course, that would lead to a sudden precipitous drop in income in those sectors, which would then feed into cascade through to demand shortfalls. Uh, across the whole economy. So all kinds of businesses would shut down in the absence of a policy response. Uh, there'd be you know, mass unemployment. People wouldn't be able to pay rent or mortgages. Millions of people would be homeless. Banks would collapse, et cetera, et cetera. We'd have a deep depression even after uh, you know, a vaccine arrives and uh, the pandemic is over as we thought at the time. Now we didn't get that. And I think it, it was probably politically impossible for us to get that. It is astonishing, you know, it was astonishing to a lot of people how quickly ideology about balancing the budget uh, went out the window, and also how technically easy it was to finance what has turned out to be an unprecedented, enormous fiscal response. But I think, you know, it's not that surprising because it was up against uh, an even stronger ideological force. Uh, and that was just the widespread panic across all of society from top to bottom at the possible evaporation of income, whatever the source was. So what we got in Australia was a very real shoring up of aggregate demand, right? So I think that was real. I'll talk about that in a second, and I think Ben's going to go into some more detail. Uh, but I think what we also saw in Australia was a willingness to let the costs of the pandemic fall on a number of groups uh, who happen to be in unfortunate situations, right? So on the fiscal policy side, so thinking in aggregate terms, it was a really big deal. That, so that the public deficit for Australia for 20, uh, 2020 to 2021 financial year across state and federal budgets, the deficit is, the cash deficits projected to be about 14% to GDP. Uh, which is huge. I mean, much bigger than any, anything. Uh, I think bigger than World War I mean, certainly given the size of the public sector, much bigger than anything World War II. In World War II, certainly much, much bigger than any deficit since. 
And real household disposable income actually rose substantially during the pandemic. So private income fell, consumption certainly fell, but once you factor in the transfers, uh, disposable household income actually rose. Uh, business profit also rose during the pandemic. So uh, businesses made more profits in the aggregate in 2020 than in uh, 2019. Uh, again, thanks to uh, the large public spending of various kinds. Uh, and the adjustment, you know, in terms of unemployment was blunted here compared to a lot of places. And of course, we were hit a lot uh, more lightly by COVID than, than a lot of places, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, you know, in the US, the labor market adjustment happened almost entirely through job losses. In the UK, they had a public uh, wage subsidy, sort of more comprehensive than we have here. And there was very little initial decline in unemployment, but people's hours fell. Australia was somewhere in the middle, right, with, with JobKeeper. Um, but of course, JobKeeper excluded a lot of people. It excluded casuals who hadn't been working for longer than a year. Uh, it excluded employers whose turnover didn't quite meet the cutoff. Uh, and the job seeker safety net, even though it was, uh, you know, substantially augmented by the special COVID payment, uh, excluded a lot of people as well, so especially migrant workers. Um, there was also very little editing of contractual obligations. So there was a lot of talk about that this time last year, right? Where are we going to give people a rent holiday? Where was there going to be a legislated, uh, or, you know, regulatory mortgage holiday? In the end, that was pretty much left to the private, to private negotiation where people's power was very unequal. Uh, the banks let a lot of people defer mortgage payments, but of course, uh, it would add to their debt. Rent, in most cases, uh, was could be deferred, but would make, you know it would, most people still had to end up paying rent or were running up arrears. Um, the other big deal, the other big thing that's happened, even though uh, employment has rebounded to some extent. Uh, the jobs that have been created have been quite different in a lot of cases from what was left. So most of the jobs, uh, I think 60% of the new jobs created uh, May to December were casual, right? So the, the impact of the pandemic on working people was very different depending on what kind of contract you had. And uh, the jobs that we're coming back with are much less secure. Women have been disproportionately affected because of the industries they're concentrated in, because the burden of extra care work when the schools closed tended to fall disproportionately on women. Uh, and also there's been uh, a substantial increase in the gender pay gap. Uh, you know, a report from the Center for Future Work recently uh, made very clear. Um, and of course we see the government now rushing through this new IR law, which sort of reinforces everything that left people vulnerable during the pandemic, right? So um, on the one hand, we saw quite a, a substantial overall fiscal response that kept that circular flow of incomes ticking over to an almost surprising extent. But on the other hand, I think the impact on people's security at work has been uh, affected in a major way. And even people in more secure contracts, uh, I'm sure can, uh, are uh, you know, certainly true of the universities, uh, we're under constant pressure. We're told, you know, we've got enterprise agreements coming up. COVID is being used in a big way uh, to put pressure on people to say we can no longer afford security. But I think that, and I'm just going to finish with this and hand over to Ben, and I think we'll start, you know, uh, deal with some of this in more, in more detail. Uh, I think what the response has shown is that you know that huge increase in the public sector has shown that we have the capacity to insulate people from even, I lost the mic, uh, even very big uh, sudden downturns in income, but uh, we have the capacity, but it's a political question how that's spread. And I think for those of us on the left, uh, those of us in the labor movement, our job is to really uh, push home that question because we can afford security, but uh, 
we're leading, we're, we're going to a situation where uh, job security, security of income is even more under threat than it was before COVID hit. I'll leave it there. Uh, I got some more things, you know, about what we could potentially do, but I'll leave that for questions and hand over to Ben. Thanks everyone. Let's, let's go straight to Ben. Um, as I said at the outset, Ben Speech Butcher is the uh, head of the uh, sociology discipline at the uh, Macquarie University, uh, a, a, a great Australian political economist, very active in the Greens, uh, and a particularly astute analyst of social policy. So thanks very much for having me uh, back at Politics in the Pub. This is one of the, the most uh, important political institutions in the, the city, so it's wonderful to be here. Um, so thanks, Frank, for the introduction. Do you want to introduce yourself again briefly? Yeah, so um, I'm Ben Spies Witcher. I'm um, in the sociology department at Macquarie University, and uh, a while ago uh, was uh, on the Committee of Politics in the Pub some, some many years ago. So it's lovely to be back, and it's lovely to be uh, speaking alongside Mike, who um, is, I agree with Frank, one of the most important. Australian uh, left intellectuals going around at the moment and has been doing an extraordinary job with Jacobin, which I really encourage everyone who isn't already subscribed to subscribe to. Um, a very important uh, centre of uh, progressive thinking. Um, so I want to pick up where uh, Michael left off and um, think about these very odd circumstances in which we came uh, to half freeze the economy, half speed it up. Um, and what, and I want to focus particularly, I suppose, on the, the political opportunities that that potentially provides for us. Uh, I think they looked at initially really bleak. They then briefly looked wildly optimistic. And I think most of us have been quietly uh, lowering our heads and um, assuming we're going back to politics as normal as much of the... Uh, the stimulus that was introduced has been gradually unwound. So for a brief moment, um, after I think almost a decade of a, a, a extensive political struggle to increase our unemployment benefit, a Conservative government decided to double it overnight, decided to suspend unilaterally virtually all mutual obligation, to radically weaken the partner test, which meant that people who lost their job who have a partner who's in work were able to actually receive it, which is extremely difficult uh, given the way the partner test works. Um, we got a wage subsidy scheme that Australia's almost never had. We decided to make childcare free, uh, briefly. All these things happened in a, what, what was, you know, quite a remarkable series of changes and I mean, going back, you know, casting your mind back, not only were we struck by how rapidly the onset of this uh, kind of catastrophe happened, and all these things in our lives shut down, and people in Victoria, or particularly in Melbourne, were shut down for um, weeks on end, uh, but also how these announcements kind of, you know, came one after the other. It was almost like every second day you had an, a, a just radical announcement by the Prime Minister and the Treasurer announcing billions of dollars that were going to be spent um, that they had said weren't needed only a few days earlier. So there's something quite remarkable about the set of circumstances that lead a Conservative government that has been dedicated as its primary, well, let's say it's got two things that's been campaigning on for the last 20 years. Um, one of them we might say is variants of racism, but the other one is fiscal constraint. That is, that the government shouldn't extend itself beyond its means. It shouldn't spend money, and we should, if anything, lower taxes rather than increase them. Um, and it is that government that had been steadily uh, trying to close down refuges, scripting and saving tiny amounts of money um, out of every social program there was in order to be able to pour its way back to a budget surplus before the next election. That was, remember, that was the entire politics. Uh, after the last election. Yeah. It was that government that decided to introduce the largest stimulus in Australia's history. It's like, it's just pretty stunning that that happened. So I think it's worth thinking through why on earth it did happen. 
What what on earth possessed these people who clearly don't believe in any of these things to do that? What happened? And, and so a large chunk of it is that there was a, a crisis that did actually affect everybody. Madonna was kind of right. Um, even 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 the very rich and powerful were going to be subject to this crisis, and um, it's no surprise. You know, the first waves of it coming into the Australia, into Australia came from Aspen. Um, as people migrated back from their winter holidays. Um, but it is also that complex web of uh, payments, which increasingly mediated by banks and by the, finance, by the finance sector, has linked everyday expenditures on where we live, on how we heat our homes, on our telephone bills, um, and on our childcare payments have increasingly linked those uh, to very complicated financial products and to the underpinnings of the finance system. And so there was this real dilemma. How is it that you stop people moving but keep money moving? Which was essentially what they were trying to do. Yeah, so we couldn't stop the money for the reasons that that Facebook group of um, landlords made very clear. People were absolutely petrified about stopping the flows of money. And so petrified, in fact, that our banking system did unilaterally decide to suspend everyone's mortgage payments, anyone who asked. And in fact, at, even at the moment, more or less, is the, the bar is not much above currently about above just asking for your mortgage payments to be suspended. Now, of course, they add on to the bill, but the bill also changed radically because um, interest rates, which have been in long-term decline for a while, also fell through the floor. So despite that enormous increase, in government debt that took place in Australia. The biggest increase really in Australia's history, our public interest bill is lower today than it was before the crisis started. A public interest bill is fallen despite the massive increase in debt because of the collapse of interest rates. So something, something weird is going on. We also had this very odd situation where people could anticipate that there might be a collapse in the most important market of all in a town like Sydney, which is of course the housing market. Um, so people all apprehended that that might happen, but no one really believed that it necessarily would happen. And so we didn't really ever see house prices fall. We did see a, a substantial fall in rents, but by suspending all of those payments, we didn't force people into the position where they have to sell their properties. And now if this had been another kind of crisis, people would have sold their properties anyway, right? One of the reasons that people sell their properties is because they think the house prices might be falling now, but they're gonna fall even further in the future. So I better get out now, well, I can at least cut my losses, yeah? But no one thought they were really gonna fall, which is why no one sold their house, yeah? As long as they could, they weren't forced to by the bank, everyone just held tight. In fact, so confident were people that we could probably withstand the crisis that the moment that incomes started to resume as normal and people would start turning up to auctions, first home buyers flooded into the market, much as they did after the GFC, and house prices have started going up again. Why? Because people anticipate that in the future, they'll rise even further. And so they, those first home buyers, better get in quick, cut their losses, pay extra now so they don't have to pay even more into the future. So there's something very weird that's gone on with the flow of incomes, with our apprehension of uh, what's going to happen and in how governments manage this crisis. And there are a couple of opportunities that I think that that has presented us with. And they haven't been properly realised yet, but let's, let's imagine that we, uh, we start to win, we organise, we mobilise things and start and go, well, what might that look? So the first thing I think is that we started to refocus on social needs, on what it is that people need in order to be able to just live together. So we started to define essential work in terms of people who do things for other people and that are really helpful, that feed them, that uh, give them care. Uh, they, were the, they were seen as the most important tasks and the associated transport and other things that are uh, are related directly to that, to feeding people, giving them care, to making sure they've got a roof over there. We value those workers briefly, we valorise them, and there clearly is an opportunity to be able to mobilise around that and talk about why those workers deserve, I think we've lost it again. There you go, no, I've, I've got it back, I'll, I'll keep pushing the button. 
Um, so we, we have a, an opportunity to be able to uh, talk about why those workers deserve. It's okay. I might I might uh, give up and just keep talking. Is that okay? Can people hear me up the back? My apologies. For that. Um, so I think you know it, that was particularly starkly seen in our sector, in the university sector, where one of the interesting things that happened, the kind of tragic but potentially powerful things that happened, was that the people who actually teach everyone uh, were about to all get sacked. So the casual workforce, so the university had built this model where they knew it was, uh, it had this exposure to risk from international students not coming. They knew they got lots of money from it, but they knew that that was a risk. And so they said, that doesn't matter. We can deal with that risk because we're only going to employ everyone on casual contracts. And if we lose the money from the international students, we'll just stop employing all the casuals. So that was the, that was the immediate plan. Uh, then they discovered that, uh, in fact, the... The need for teaching increased. It didn't decrease as we tried to move every, everyone online. So it wasn't possible to just not employ any of the casuals because they were the ones who were teaching everyone. So they had to keep on uh, paying them, and that started to cause, at least temporarily, for a number of universities, quite large deficits. But alongside that, the other thing that had been happening in universities, which is that people at the very top had been both multiplying in number and massively increasing their salaries, started to come under at least some renewed scrutiny. And there was a discussion about how it was that the people who seemed to be doing this very important work, and in universities that was the casual tutors, but in hospitals we had healthcare workers, we had the people who were in Deliveroo who were risking their lives, often getting killed without um, any form of insurance in order to be able to deliver food. Um, Childcare workers, how is it that all these people had poor pay, poor conditions, and yet seem to be completely essential. We, we have an opportunity to be able to build on that, to be able to keep that story going and talking about that, and to be able to talk about why it is that people who don't seem to do any of those things get paid quite so much. We also got to see, as Mike said, that governments can do all sorts of things that we never thought was possible, and virtually overnight. Strangely, poverty in Australia fell last year. It didn't increase. Now, for some groups of people, extreme forms of poverty increase, particularly for migrant workers. So the people who are completely excluded from job keeper and job seeker experience very extreme forms of poverty. Um, and one of my colleagues has been involved in a study of international students, which, you know, showed, you know, effectively depression era on the bread line, lining up for food handouts every day, um, living in radically overcrowded accommodation, that kind of nightmare scenario was entirely reality for a minority of people in Australia. But for many others, homelessness fell. It seemed that having talked about how complicated homelessness was, how difficult it was to solve, how entrenched it was, how governments couldn't really do anything, within a matter of weeks, there were virtually no, one, no people left rough sleeping and a series of new arrangements put in place for other forms of insecure housing. Not all adequate, but homelessness fell precipitously. Poverty fell precipitously. At the, uh, at the top end, so we wonder, production fell, right? Fell radically. So the amount of stuff we produced fell. The amount of stuff being consumed at, by most people at the bottom of the income ladder was increasing. That is, suddenly people who are on new start were able to afford the medicines they needed, they could afford fresh food. Um, yeah, a whole, so their real consumption increased for a whole range of people. So how do we square the circle? What happened? We were producing less and all these people are consuming more. What happened? Well, the incomes of people at the top were often rising and certainly their wealth was increasing. So we saw the wealth of people like um, Bezos and the, the captains of industry skyrocket, but their consumption levels fell dramatically. Why? because they couldn't go to the opera, they couldn't fly to Aspen, like we physically shut down forms of conspicuous consumption. And as a result, we had a real redistribution of consumption from the very top to the bottom and the middle. That really happened. Uh, we showed it was possible and, in, and it, we, we can keep doing it. We did it with government spending less on interest payments in the end of the beginning. So we have some exciting possibilities. Now, our government, 
was never committed to that. And our government, and I'll wrap up on this, was um, always committed to phasing out the, the temporary social democracy that Australia implemented. Um, and it has been doing that quite successfully, unfortunately. Um, at the beginning of this crisis, writing something that uh, Frank uh, put together a special issue uh, along with David Primrose on um, the COVID crisis. And I optimistically said, look, it, it's very easy, like it, it's, it's easy to tolerate for governments. It is easy to tolerate poverty and homelessness. It's very hard for them to directly be seen to introduce those things. It's been really hard to, for a Conservative government after eight years of trying very, very hard to wind back Medicare in any substantial way. And it really did try. Remember the, you know, the co-payments and the... It's really hard to do that. So optimistically, I thought, if we really do radically reduce poverty, if we really do radically reduce homelessness, surely it will be hard for any government to consciously and deliberately reintroduce poverty and homelessness. Unfortunately, uh, it's turned out that this is quite a skilled government um, at being able to consciously and deliberately do those things, as it is, has already done in one um, round and is planning to do um, at the end of the month. But the, the debate has transformed. Um, if we went back uh, a year and a half and people said, look, we know we've been campaigning increased new start, but will a Conservative government do it? No one would have thought that was possible. I don't think anyone seriously thought that was possible. We've had a very disappointing increase, but a Conservative government has permanently increased New Start by $25. We've had a Labor government that now, a Labor opposition that is now committed to saying that it thinks that payments should be above the poverty line. That is a much more substantial increase that it is lining itself up for than would ever have seemed plausible in the last two or three years, even under a much more, a much braver uh, opposition under Shorten than the one that we currently have. And we now have uh, currently in um, Canberra uh, a real push on based around increasing uh, payments to at least $80 a day, which has got mainstream attention, is getting a, a serious mainstream debate, which is way above what ACOS or any of even the advocates around anti-poverty work were campaigning against 18 months ago. If we look over to the United States, and I'm not sure if people have been following what's been going on with Biden's stimulus program, but I think we can look and see what a government that is trying to use this moment to reset the rules rather than to do it temporarily and take it all away, what that might look like. Um, and very soon, the stimulus package that's passed will mean that most poor households uh, with children in the United States will be at least $7,000 a year better off. Child poverty is about to half in the United States and poverty overall is about to decrease by a third, almost overnight. Now, some of those measures are still temporary, partly reflecting the politics of trying to line up around the midterm so the Democrats can campaign on winning something. Uh, but I think it does outline that there is a real program of talking about social needs, of reprioritizing the workers that actually directly give us the things that allow us to live decent lives, um, and which say that government shouldn't be subject to arbitrary fiscal constraints that mean that it's acceptable to say that people should be allowed to starve because governments shouldn't run up a deficit. And that politics, I think, is under threat. And everything we can do to tip it over the edge, everything we can do to say the United States has just outspent Australia, even in GDP terms, and they're fine. There is absolutely no problem with us spending more money. And that that spending really does mean that people live better lives and we really are reducing poverty. That's a real choice and we demand that you make it. We have set up to allow that to happen. And I hope that possibly over the next 12 months, we're going to see a politics that allows some of that to happen in Australia too. Thanks, Now time for questions from the audience. Who'd like to begin? Yes. There we are. Thank you, um, Brett, and thank you, the speakers. Uh, this looks like we're, uh, we're seeing, we seem to be 
in a similar uh, situation, but better than almost 100 years ago in the Great Depression where John Maynard Keynes came out with a more radical model than what was uh, presented by the neoclassicals. I couldn't solve the problem. And uh, you know, I, my, my question really is, isn't it about time we question the very mathematics of the models that we talk about? Because I've been studying Henry George myself. And uh, the deeper I study Henry George, and the more mathematical I look at it, the more he makes sense, even more than John Maynard Keynes, because he captures one thing that uh, other economic models can't, including modern monetary theory, including uh, Keynes himself. It's economic rents. It's a synergy of society that's produced, that belongs to no one individual, but to everyone. The reason why we managed to not have a housing crash was because we allowed the homeowners to preserve their economic rents. When it could have been an opportunity for the government to swap debt and restore the government's role in providing public housing for all because right now I've seen a serious problem outside Sydney where right now I've seen boomers selling their homes in Sydney to settle outside of Sydney, drive prices up and drive rents up and threat and create threaten to create a whole new class of homelessness in the countryside when that could have been avoided. So I, that's my basic question. Is it about time we redesign the mathematical models themselves? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I don't feel competent to comment on George in particular. Um, but on Keynes, I, I mean, one thing I would say is that it, it, it's not just a uh, change in ideas that we're looking at since the Great Depression. I think in some ways that the, that comparison is useful because it, what we've been through actually, I think, is a massive historical event that will be looked back upon for decades. Um, but one thing that I would say is not just, it's not so much that the ideas have changed, but also that the size of the public sector is just so much bigger than it was in the 30s, right? And uh, so, that is a huge element of what uh, happened in the last year is that even though, you know, I doubt anybody in the Morrison government considers them a considers themselves a Keynesian, even though I still think that, you know, macroeconomics has become part of the common sense of, of policy making. But it's because, you know, we've been through an unprecedented uh, stimulus in part because the public sector is just so much larger relative to GDP than it was back then. On the land stuff, um, I you know I, I fully agree that there's a lot to talk about about what's going on with house prices, what's going on um, with uh, the ability of people to derive incomes and wealth from uh, asset price inflation. Essentially, uh, I don't feel qualified to comment on George in particular, um, but I think it is an important thing to to talk about. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, I, I mean, yes, taxing away rents, which is the essential Georgia's position. Um, so this is unearned income just from your control of an asset and resources. I, I, I think a, a shift in that direction is certainly one that is both going to be good and going to be required by the ecological transition that we hopefully are going to have. Um, I don't think it's necessarily only part of that story. Uh, and I, I think it's important to, uh, to reinforce what Mike was saying. It's not just the, the change in ideas. In fact, um, while people might not formally accept modern monetary theory, it's pretty clear that there's some pretty innovative monetary policy that's now been completely accepted by policy elites around the world. Um, but that only works in the interest of everybody when there are powerful political movements that force governments to do things. And if there aren't those powerful political movements, it doesn't matter what the ideas are, they will keep on doing what they're already doing. Um, 
So, you know, in, in that, that light, I mean, I think a lot of the shift that's taken place, we saw the, um, the opening up of space from COVID, but um, encourage anyone who's not already uh, connected to the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, they're the guys down in, um, in Canberra at the moment demanding $80 a day. And I think they have been a really big part of being able to shift the debate. And that is just as important as the ideas. So just something occurred to me, just if you, if you don't mind it. Uh, I, this is a really great book on uh, has come out in the last year by Brett Christopher's uh, British slash Swedish uh, geographer slash political economist, uh, Rantia Capitalism. And I think that he really makes a good case. And he has the best analysis on the importance of rent, not just land rent, but uh, rent, all kinds of rents, including you know intellectual property, the rent that you get from monopolizing a you know a particular public service, natural resource rents. I think if people want to get into the political economy of rents, I think it's a really great book. And one of the points that he makes is, I mean, there is something different about uh, residential real estate. And that is unlike all of these other forms of property, which tend to be very highly concentrated, uh, land, you know, residential real estate is something that, you know, that broad upper half of the income distribution feels that they have, that own houses, feels that they have some particular stake in, which makes the politics of it extremely difficult. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Ben, you mentioned two words that stood out to me. One was scrutiny, the other one was um, I'm not getting out of my way. Um, last year, I noticed that um, we were trading officially the unemployment around 7%. But when you factor in things like JobKeeper, where people are paid but actually did nothing, people say a, a, um, it's a health issue. But when you if you if we had information that said, for example, total unemployment is more like 20% rather than 7 or 8%, that distortion information, is that actually playing to the game for these master craftsmen of um, um, pretty much um, bastardising social equity for uh, political gain and also distorting uh, economies? What do, you, what do you think on that? And secondly, um, in regards to uh, the real economy, uh, last year and even now, apparently the stock market has been at record levels in both Australia and America, and yet lay people, if you use the crude term from the US, uh, Wall Street has been having record um, profits, and yet mainstream, um, Main Street, lay people, have actually been feeding the real um, pressures of what's been going on the last 12 months in particular, um, and sometimes that may actually mask true poverty rather than absolute poverty. Um, so, could you comment on, um, in terms of this recalibration or re-adjustment uh, of where we can go from here, uh, is it, do we need to start focusing on other factors, um, uh, for example, with political uh, pressures that are now happening in Canberra, that's actually starting to shift in um, getting to the realms of, say, uh, business, economics, um, social equity, the environment. Um, are those the sort of things that are going to have to become far more important and have to be um, measured and looked at on par with uh, economic models to be able to have a, a, a broader and a more realistic picture of what's going on here and in, rather than what we do up until now, seems to be a very narrow band of statistics that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense if you're outside the economics realm. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, completely. I mean, there's, we, there's a lot of numbers we talked about that, you know, don't seem to quite make sense. And um, I encourage you to read um, my Beck's uh, piece and jacket. One of the things that they say there is uh, it's really hard to make, to reduce people's standard of living without them getting angry. Yeah. Um, and so we've had this myth that we have reasonably low unemployment for a long time. Uh, but he, at the peak of this crisis, the government had to admit that underemployment was skyrocketing and that people didn't have enough money. Uh, and that's because lots and lots of people were suddenly affected by it. It was reducing their real standard of living and making lots of people angry, and that has real political effects. So um, absolutely mobilising around those that real lived experience of, people, of people's lives getting worse that's about to happen. It is already happening for lots and lots of people. And 
giving people um, ways of being able to understand why that's happening. That's happening because of decisions that politicians are making, not because of things that they're doing. And being able to have a collective response to that that says there's an alternative to do this, I think that is absolutely central to how we are going to do this. This has to be about people's lived experience, not just about the numbers. I completely agree. And just really quickly, if I can say on that, uh, yeah, the underemployment question is a really good one. And I think uh, obviously underemployment in terms of, you know, not people losing their jobs, but losing hours uh, certainly went up much higher than unemployment. My understanding from the data that's come out recently is that it's actually come right back down again, right? So most of what's left of unemployment uh, is actual change in, in jobs rather than hours. So the, the, the hours have been much more flexible than the jobs. Uh, but absolutely, that was a big deal. Uh, and on the other side of your question, the asset side, I think is a very interesting one as well. The fact that uh, the share market and also house prices, as Ben talked about, it, remains uh, high throughout and rising through all of this. I think that just it goes to show that right? I think that it's certainly true that stimulus, when money goes up, uh, it, it certainly does. I mean, there's nothing keeping people from putting it into uh, uh, their wealth. And I think, I mean, we saw that in Australia that overall, for example, uh, mortgage payment, mortgage repayments actually accelerated under COVID in the aggregate. So even though some people are having a lot of trouble meeting their mortgages, there was that phenomenon of a lot of people who are, you know, working at home without much to spend their money on, but re receiving their normal salaries, uh, people put that money into their offset accounts. And, and uh, so that, you know, was, you know, mortgage repayments were happening at, at very high levels. And I think I read a story today about in the States about the number of people in the US saying that they're going to put part of their stimulus checks into day trading on the stock market, I guess it's another another part of the phenomenon. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. Uh, yeah. I think I think we've got time for perhaps two more questions. Uh, is there any women who would like to ask a question? We're getting a bit. Uh, but, uh, oh, okay, go for it. Hello. Also, not English, and I couldn't understand that much conversation because my listening ability. But I don't know if it's question, question, or my statement. <laughs> uh, I just wanna um, say I don't know uh, how many people know about pandemic visa. I'm on visa, um, pandemic visa. It's, the uh, visa, um, you know, the backpackers, tourists, and working holiday makers study in Australia can apply this visa to remain in Australia. And I chose to remain in Australia because I don't want to go back to my country because it's not safe. It's safer than Australia. And I needed to apply, I needed to prepare lots of documents to apply this pandemic visa. And uh, this means I need to need me to work in a critical sector in Australia, like care work, hospital job, and food processing, and farm job. Because lots of people, uh, lots of like farmers and hospital care, disability people, aged care, uh, need workers, but not, not workers in Australia. Uh, but because they lost lots of backpackers go back to their own country. But I wanted to stay in Australia uh, after the pandemic happened. So I chose to remain in Australia. Uh, but it was a bit hard to prepare the document, everything, like bank statement, blah, 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 everything, to apply this visa. And uh, compared to New Zealand, New Zealand government automatically and extend the visa to everyone, like working holiday. But Australia government um, require lots of documents to like, extend. Otherwise, oh, you can go back to your country. Or you need to do critical work <laughs> to support Australian economy. And they um, require higher tax, very high tax to um, pandemic visa. Um, 
I really, lots, I met lots of people in a hostel. I like keep seeking, I was keep seeking critical sector job because I was care worker in Japan. And I wanted to find a care worker in Australia, but I didn't have any qualification or certification in Australia. So it was so difficult. But I found a job in the park street, food processing park streets. And I'm waiting for the permission from immigration now. And the point is, <laughs> lots of backpackers want to go to New Zealand as soon as possible to escape from Australia <laughs> because they don't want to pay high tax and like doing like modern slavery job in a farm and factory. I can totally understand. <laughs> and I also want to go to New Zealand because it was my plan to go back to New Zealand, but the flight was cancelled because of COVID. So I chose to remain in Australia, but the government <laughs> do like this kind of stuff <laughs> to the backpackers, uh, working holiday makers, tourists, and the family of the people, uh, these kind of people. So lots of people are like, struggling to get a visa now. And we need to find a critical sector work. And, uh, this is the situation, yeah. <laughs> So I want to just um, like, want to be visible. <laughs> I mean, uh, what can you say to that except that it's, it's disgusting really. I mean, it's, a, it's another example of what Ben was talking about with uh, the people who do the, the teaching, most of the teaching at a university, right? And we realized during the pandemic how necessary the work was, we're very reliant on that work, and yet in the aftermath, in, your, in the sort of return to normal, uh, they don't care. They're willing to just, uh, you know, leave people in exactly the precarious condition that they began with. It's terrible. Yeah, they abandoned the fiscal constraint, but they never abandoned the racism, unfortunately. All right. Thank, thank you very much for your contribution to yeah, the discussion. I think that's really extended the dimensions of uh, what we're considering to be very important social questions about how we relate to people who are visiting from other countries. Um, yeah, go on. Okay. Cameraman's uh, option. Oh, oh, yeah. Very quickly. Well, I'd like to say that this is very characteristic. We went to the um, immigration officers, uh, uh, it was common, they were common office for over a year, every week for a year. We couldn't get to see him once. I contacted the uh, Reesby paper, which is the torch. They wouldn't report it, but it was a great. Uh, and, and some of us were constituents of, in that uh, his electorate, which was banks. Um, and, and like, who knows this? Who knows about you? Well, thankfully you've spoken out and we all do. We all know about that. And this is something someone should really take up. So thank you. Look, I'm going to get some t-shirt made. T-shirts made. My first one was I'm thinking of where have all the political t-shirts gone. Uh, that was the first one. But the second one, I think really what came out of your talk for me was this. It's 1968. We're also having a badge made by the way, anyway, of the three three uh, uh, athletes on the dais at the Olympics. Uh, stand up and be counted. But the T-shirt, I thought, should be forced in 1968, I think from France, Paris, in that year. Be realistic, demand the impossible. What do you think about that? I mean, while, while we're talking slogans, I, uh, there was one thing I didn't, I didn't, I cut for reasons of time, but my favorite slogan of the, of the pandemic, I think, is one. There was one by the artist Ian Allen Paul, who made up a, a face mask riffing off Marx, where he says, a pandemic isn't a collection of viruses, but a social relation among people mediated by viruses. And I think that's the whole point of what we're talking about, really, is that it, you know, the, the effects of the virus, the vectors were, were social and economic as much as they were, uh, you know, literally viral. Uh, and we had, you know, what Ben and I both said, I guess, is that we've shown that we have choices about what can be done, political choices. Uh, we've shown the capacity of things that can be done, uh, you know, what seemed impossible. Uh, and it's up to us, I suppose, to make the case for, you know, to prosecute that and not uh, allow a return to the normal, back to normal politics. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, and I love the slogan. Yeah. I want to um, just read it. Uh, I live in Campbelltown, I can talk to um, I just wanted to reiterate what uh, what the, the, the word over there was talking about with the idea of social visibility um, and how much COVID-19 has, has, has amplified that. Um, working as a community worker, um, I'm finding it very difficult to do projects in the last year or so. Um, very much so because uh, the people that I'm supposed to be coming to work with have gone to ground. Um, so I have a personal and professional interest in seeing what changes, what remains the same. Uh, I do wonder upon what how much of that can happen through social policy, how much of that can happen through social movements. Um, it's been a very inspiring week, um, particularly with, um, with women's efforts to expose some of the underground stuff that's happening at the political class. Um, I feel like there's a lot of that uh, stuff that can be uncovered, and I think that comes through social movements rather than social policy. So I'm wondering whether where the tank where the, where there's some clarity between both and I hope you're not drawing up a, a false flag point of view, but I feel like there's some dedication to be made if we either make sense of what's what's going to happen into the future, um, and also at the risk of being effective suit say as what the future is going to look like. <laughs> suit say is always good. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that exactly it's going to be movements to determine where we go to from here. And um, it was extraordinarily inspiring with all the people in the streets yesterday. Um, but that comes out of a kind of moment of crisis, right? But awful things have been allowed to happen for a very, very long time. Um, and there is a moment when we get to see just how awful they are. And we need to use that to be able to change things. I think um, we also see just how hard it is to change them even in those moments, just how um, strongly the political class and the media class stick together to be able to prevent change. Um, so it's gonna be really hard, but if we can mobilize people, then um, I think some of the, the positive changes, responses that we saw through COVID can be brought back and made permanent. But that'll only happen if we get lots of people in the streets and lots of people active. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I, I think it's uh, incredibly important for, I mean, so much of what's going on in, uh, well, I don't even want to say the margins, but I mean, really large sectors of, of Sydney and elsewhere in the country. And, you know, I, I have a mother-in-law and other family members working in uh, social work who tell, you know, routinely tell stories uh, that, you wouldn't believe, and you know, I, I think it's important. And, you know, the the actual outfall, out, uh, you know, fallouts from economic ups and downs, and even just the ordinary workings of the economy uh, that we never hear about. I think it is extremely important to to make those bring them out, and to take every opportunity that we have to uh, to get that out. And um, yeah, I mean feed it into uh, a proper, you know, effective social movement, absolutely. We've got time for one more question. I think from over here. Uh, here. Actually, it's very brief. I, my, what I wanted to say, a bit of a comment and a question, and actually I think it um, connects a lot with what Ms. just said. Um, so uh, earlier you said that uh, the government almost overnight made these huge changes um, and that was very surprising but I think it's all very important to note that part of that um, necessity to act was to do with the union being involved with those, those decisions about how to deal with and what kind of extra money had to go 
into everybody's lives to keep things moving. And now, I mean, that worked for a very short time. And now the, uh, the government, federal government, is really attacking working people's rights and working conditions. And as you just answered, I think it's going to come back down to people being very active in going to the streets or contacting house bench centres, all kinds of things. And would you like to comment further? But I think that that's, you know, the government could take those actions briefly and then very soon after, because that's not who they really are. Is actually very I want to ask you your question before you go. Yeah. It, it, it's a quick one. Yeah. Oh, 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 thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I, I came here to listen and to learn. I'm always doing that. Look, I do have to run, but I was, I'm a little, um, I'm, I understand most of what you said, but neither of you mentioned the word proactivity. And I think that's, pretty important. I probably come from the other side of politics to some people in this room, notwithstanding I have a very strong social conscience. Um, you know, we've, we've got a, we have an obligation to do our best to look after everybody. I certainly believe that. However, proactivity is important because if we're going to be paying uh, all these people who can't work, unable to work, don't work for whatever reason, someone's going to have to produce to afford that. And I guess that was my only question to you, both. but as I said, I'm here to listen and learn, and I thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with you about the importance of unions at the moment. Having been through a fairly brutal year in the university sector, I think we both have. And, uh, um, uh, you know, but I actually feel like in, in the in the university sector and other areas as well, uh, we made a difference in the last year, absolutely at different levels, but at the political level in terms of arguing for particular, well, fighting back against some of the worst uh, possibilities, but also uh, I think it's very important for people to fight not only at the policy level, but also in their own workplaces to defend their conditions. I think that, that, um, one of the things that Beck and I said in our, piece, in our piece last year is that whatever happens with the political response, uh, organizations, you know, whether you, we're talking about public sector or quasi-public sector like universities or large firms actually still had, uh, uh, you know, there was a lot to play for and there were still, uh, a lot of organizations were opportunistic and are continuing to be opportunistic about the effects of the pandemic. Uh, and I think that there's, you know, the policy realm is very important, but I still think there's a lot to be played for at uh, individual workplaces. Uh, and of course, the combination, like we've got to push back against uh, what the government's trying to do now with the, the omnibus bill uh, as well. On the productivity question, I mean, very quickly, um, I think it's true, but in a situation where uh, demand, we're risking losing, uh, or we have lost huge amounts of private demand, uh, the worst, you know, the absolute worst thing for productivity is uh, a fall away in demand. I mean, it makes people, resources go to waste. People's capacity to work goes to waste. So I think the very first thing is to get demand up and running, make sure people have the incomes to buy things. And I think that that is very much uh, the first thing that we should be focusing on. Uh, because in the absence of demand, while unemployment is still very high, um, people's capacity to work and the, um, uh, the means of production are going unused, right? So I think that demand management is absolutely the biggest thing for increasing productivity at the moment still. Yeah, and thank you for the question. Thanks for coming along and, and listening. Really appreciate it. That's great. <laughs> um, I think what the, on the productivity question, I completely agree with the stuff on demand, but I think it's useful to know that not only, so the US uh, reform is modeled on a uh, Canadian change that happened under Trudeau, uh, which also substantially reduced child poverty, actually one that the whole government implemented here as well. And they effectively created a basic income for kids. Um, and the, the evidence on that is now in, and that had absolutely no effect 
on preventing people from working. In fact, it, it led to people working more, not working less, and led to much better outcomes for kids, which means that they're much more likely to be productive workers in the future. Um, and that's partly because there's a whole bunch of problems generated by, pro by poverty, which are bad for productivity. And, and creating at least a floor for people and doing so efficiently by making sure that people at least have enough money without lots of bureaucracy around it is quite an effective way of doing that. Um, and the, the, the final thing I'll say, thank you very much for the question is, um, if you haven't already emailed the Crossbench Senate, Senators about the IR bill, you should. It's in the Senate now. And it, it potentially is about to make all the problems of casual work worse. Um, so please let them know. Thank you. And the final comment from me on productivity, I think the question that our experience under COVID means that we have to think more broadly about productivity. It's not the same as profits. It's not the same as contributions directly to gross national product. There's a broader concept of social productivity. What is useful? What are the necessary underpinnings for a good society? Some of that care work that our speakers were talking about earlier needs to be heavily valued. A lot of unpaid labor is very productive in the sense of keeping our capacity to improve our general well being as a society. So I think here, this is what we've learned from COVID. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, of course, finally, I have uh, a couple of pleasant wrap ups. One is, of course, to announce that our next session of Politics in the Pub in two weeks' time is on the challenge facing the people of West Papua. This is a very difficult, sorry, four weeks' time, my apologies. There's an intervening break. Four weeks' time, at the same place, hopefully, uh, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be having a, a rather different kind of discussion about intense and ongoing problems in that uh, neighbouring country to the north. Uh, Philip? Sorry, okay, yep. Very quick one to thank Kathy Vogan, especially for the behind the scenes um, technical stuff, which she's put in a, a lot of time into, which she reminded me of when we stuffed up earlier on. <laughs> so thank you, Kathy. And Peter Murphy, who, uh, who also came on and set everything up. That was fantastic. And the two audience members, all the audience members, but especially um, Christine and Kit, many, many thanks. That was absolutely invaluable. And also, I uh, kind of let it pass before saying, uh, on Fridays at uh, the Town Hall Steps, 5 p.m., uh, is both two demonstrations. There's the Free Assange one, which they're always very inventive and creative and musical and brilliant. And there's also the uh, Refugee Lives Matter on the other side of the steps. Um, and the, the Assange people have actually occupied the Town Hall Steps and taken them back and not let the council get in the way. In fact, it's, it's, it's brilliant. And we would like, actually I would like, uh, what they have in Madrid, uh, uh, well, refugees welcome on the town hall, because it's actually part of their policy, which they're keeping a very good secret. But we will persuade them of that. And I think that's all. Uh, thank you. Uh, a plug for me, since we're talking about events, we might also talk about books. The latest issue of the Journal of Australian Political Economy, the, the biggest issue ever produced, is on the biggest challenge I think that we face, along with creating a healthy and sustainable society, and that is creating a democratic society. And it's a special issue with a whole lot of articles about capitalism and democracy. Have we come to the parting of the ways? Obviously, the Trump phenomenon is what brings and brought that into people's mind. But this, this discussion, I think, tonight, which has been very profound, I think also raises questions not just about the nature of the problem, but about the political processes by which we may find a way forward from here. So, in winding up, let me thank you uh, on your behalf to the two speakers, Ben Speaks Butcher and Mike Briggs. And thank you all and good night. Thank you.